The following lesson is linked to learning outcome 2, reading and viewing, and addresses the assessment standard which requires learners to be able to recognize the socio-political and cultural backgrounds of texts. think these shots were taken? It seems to be a place where arts and culture are important. Here are some more clues. A stage, an audience and lights. You've got it. The shots were taken at a theatre, the Market Theatre in Newtown, Johannesburg, to be exact. In this series of lessons, we'll be learning about drama and as an example of a play, we'll be looking at extracts from James Nobos' play, The Suitcase, which was performed at the Market Theatre. But firstly, let's find out how drama got started in South Africa. Here are the outcomes of this lesson. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to state some of the key events in the history of South African theatre, discuss some political and cultural influences on South African theatre. South Africa has a rich oral tradition of storytelling and the history of South African theatre also goes back a long way. In 1830, a play entitled Kaiki Kekelbeck or Life Among the Hottentots was written by Andrew Geddes Baines and performed by the Grahamstown Amateur Company. And in the early 20th century, missionaries used drama in education. In the 20s and 30s, stage performances became an increasingly popular form of entertainment. At this time, groups such as the Mitetwe Lucky Stars and the Bantu Dramatic Society made this kind of more formal theatre accessible to more people. In the 30s and 40s, South African theatre became even more popular with the emergence of Hebed Dlomo. Hebed Dlomo was the first black playwright to be published in English and he was the first to use theatre to challenge colonial domination. Then, during the 50s, Theatre groups like the Barreti Players and the African Music and Drama Association formed in areas where performing arts was popular, such as Sophia Town. These groups were part of an exciting development in theatre that saw a range of styles and traditions being mixed together. For example, singing, dancing, humour and jazz from American theatre were combined with English and African traditions. But as exciting as these developments were, theatre could not escape the discriminatory laws of apartheid and so during this time, black theatre practitioners were not allowed to work in the so-called white theatres. However, this didn't mean there was no hope for black artists. In 1959, King Kong, a theatre musical, opened to multiracial audiences in South Africa and went on to have a successful season in London. This play helped to launch the careers of Miriam Makeba and Todd Machigeza. Not all white theatre practitioners were happy with segregation in theatre. In the late 1950s, Ethel Fugard collaborated with black intellectuals and members of union artists in Sophia Town to produce his first significant play entitled No Good Friday. This play showed what life was like in the townships and illustrated how police were often more concerned with enforcing apartheid laws rather than criminal laws. Another interesting fact about this play is that when it was performed to white audiences, Fugard, who played the only white role, was replaced with a black actor because black and white actors could not perform together. The theme of discrimination is one that Fugard continued to use in most of his later plays. Theatre practitioner, lecturer and current artistic director of the Market Theatre, Malcolm Perkey, spoke to us about Ethel Fugard's contribution to South African theatre. Ethel Fugard is a, one of the most significant South African theatre makers, writers, directors. And it's interesting to note that in 1960, he wrote a play called The Blood Knot. And in that play, there's a, a struggle, a creative struggle between two brothers, one who can pass for white and, and one who's very, very black. And uh, they are tied together by a blood knot. And that blood knot is the condition of the South African theatre that we've been struggling with for 30 years. Over the years since then, Fugard has 
made or written some absolutely remarkable plays. The one that comes to mind immediately is The Island, a beautiful reworking of one of the great uh, Greek plays, Antigone, into a play about conditions of living on Robben Island, uh, very much about what it means to be incarcerated on the island, very much about what it means to be free or not free, very much about what it means to be involved in making theatre with limited resources. One of, the, one of the things that Fugard did in the early years of his development is that he worked with groups in the Eastern Cape. And uh, two major plays came out of that, uh, The Island and Suzubans is Dead, uh, both created with uh, John Carney and Winston Chawner. And Sizubanzi's Bunzi is Dead, for example, is having a renewal this year, a, re a, re a revival, uh, with John Carney and Winston Chawner in it. And that play, The Island, is one of our most remarkable plays. There's so many Fugard plays, it's impossible to name them all. Um, Master Harold and the Boys, My Children, My Africa, Road to Mecca, uh, The Blood Knot. Uh, he has a remarkable uh, productivity, which is absolutely central to South African theatre. Ethel Fugard's contribution to South African theatre is quite amazing, but other playwrights also played an important role. During the 1950s and 1960s, a vibrant township theatre movement began to evolve. Gibson Kente was also an important player in this era. He created shows that were produced and performed by black people for a black audience that addressed issues such as love, adultery, alcoholism and crime. His productions included Manana, the Jazz Prophet, Sikalo, Can You Take It, La Duma, and Mama and the Load. By the 1970s, theatre was used more and more to voice the people's resistance to apartheid, and it was during this time that protest theatre emerged. Protest theatre is the name given to theatre in South Africa during apartheid that commented on and protested against the government and the political and social state of the country. We asked Malcolm Perkey, who was very involved in theatre during this time, about the role that theatre played in the struggle against apartheid. It's clear that South African theatre is a theatre that emerged in a very particular political and social landscape. And that landscape is about colonialism and apartheid. And any creative artist worth their salt had to engage with the questions thrown up by apartheid. And what we see in the South African theatre in particular, although it's everywhere in all the art forms, is that you can't ignore the conditions in which we lived. So that by the 60s, for example, the African National Congress was banned, the Pan-Africanist Congress was banned, the South African Communist Party had been banned 10 years before. By late 60s, the conditions are such that we get uh, the emergence of a black consciousness movement driven by someone like Steve Bantu Biko, Biko and uh, by 76 we have the Soweto uprising and all of this through to the state of emergency in 86 and then the transitional period from 90 to 94 influences and feeds the South African theatre. In turn the South African theatre feeds our consciousness about how to struggle for freedom and in my view um, theatre in South Africa is much bigger than just being a protest theatre. What it really is, it's, it's, a, it's a deep cultural manifestation of engagement with the, the extraordinary qualities of life, difficult and brutal and fraught, that we had to struggle with every day. Malcolm also told us about some of the highlights in theatre in the 70s. If we talk about the 70s, and the early 70s in particular, one of the most important things was the emergence of the space theatre in Cape Town. It was a free space, an open space, a space that deliberately flouted the laws of apartheid. And a number of big projects emerged in the space. Uh, the island, Sizubanzi is dead, for example, I think had one of their earliest performances there. Um, in the case of uh, Workshop 71, they developed survival there. Um, it, it was almost as if there were certain kinds of conditions being laid down. Workshop 71 was very important in the early 70s and uh, um, in my case, for example, by the mid-70s mid with something like uh, the Soweto uprisings influencing all our lives, uh, Junction Avenue Company emerged with a play like uh, The Fantastical History of a Useless Man. Uh, what was really happening, I guess, in the 70s is that 
we were sensing the, the, the first phase of development of the language system for the theater. So on the one hand, we had black consciousness theater, drums, flute, poetry. On the other hand, we had the strong works of Fugard emerging. Uh, in another corner, we had Workshop 71 setting out a certain kind of theater. We also had the beginnings of the possibility that theater would emerge in the trade union as a cultural form of struggle. During the 1970s, 80s, and early 90s, the market theater in Johannesburg played a very important role in the development of South African theater and the South African democracy. Since the play we're going to be examining in this series of lessons was shot at the market theater, let's hear a bit more about this theater's particular history. The market theater is an extraordinary, occupies an extraordinary building. And uh, it's a building that was originally designed in the great sort of spirit of the Victorian buildings. So it's very large, it's very beautifully designed, it's quite extraordinary. Nobody would build a fruit market like this anymore, anywhere in the world. Um, it was built in 1912. Uh, by the late 60s, it was clear that it was no longer able to function in this area. Exactly why, I'm not sure. Uh, I think it wasn't just literally big enough for a fruit market anymore. And so there was a chance in the early 70s that the building was going to be knocked down. Thank goodness that uh, certain individuals, Manny Manum, Barney Simon among them, and certain city councillors, even in a apartheid city council, had enough long distance sight to know that they had to save the building. And if you go into the main theatre of the market theatre, it's so obviously a space that's like a great Shakespearean place or like a great theatre for an amphitheatre space. Seeing as though the market theatre is well known for its protest plays, we asked Malcolm Perky if he could shed a bit more light on the topic of protest theatre. One of the great uh, ideas that Ethel Fugard and Barney Simon between them put on the agenda is the notion of bearing witness, unflinching bearing witness. It's, it's, it's not that we want to make a protest theatre, it's that if we live in such a country as South Africa during apartheid with all its extraordinary brutality, difficulty and life, if we as artists witness that clearly and carefully, there will be an extraordinary theatre that follows. And so it's not so much that there was a, there was a passion automatically to make protest theatre. What there was was a passion to, to reflect back to ourselves and to the world in which we lived, uh, the kinds of life we were, li we were living. And so my personal view again is that protest theatre is, is just, it's not quite the right word or the name, the right name. What we did have, it's true, and even in my own company, is that we believed that theatre could tell stories that the state wanted hidden or tell stories about parts of our everyday lives and our everyday accents and our everyday passions and everyday, everyday desires that otherwise wouldn't be told. And in that sense, if you do all of that, if you simply witness or you simply reflect or you engage in, in a more advanced level ideas of the revelation of the hidden structures that keep societies going, inevitably you're going to get a very rich and complex theatre. And that's what happened at the market and all around the market because one of the powers of the market theatre was that it was able to enter into co-productions with a number of small companies. Mahesh Maponya's company, Junction Avenue, Workshop 71 and other companies of which there were many, many earth players, uh, committed artists, Bongeni and Gemma. Uh, it was that which brought in the diversity of product and this wonderful rich range of, of extraordinary um, work. Protest theatre was an important part of the struggle against apartheid because it helped to get audiences thinking about the political system in South Africa. In fact, the theatre practitioners who put on protest plays were so committed to sharing their messages that although many of these plays were not funded, they were produced anyway, often with many of the traditional roles such as producer, director, actor, scriptwriter being played by one person. But what about South African theatre today? Does it still play a social commentary role? What do you think? Is theatre still an important part of our social and political heritage or is it now just about entertainment? What themes do you think theatre should focus on today? 
there are a number of young playwrights and directors as well as actors who are making their names known in South African theatre today. For example, Lesikho Rampolukeng, Laura Foot Newton, Oli Norman, Heinrich Reisenhofer and Oscar Peterson, Fiona Coyne, Mark Lottering, Nasli George, Rajesh Gopi and Matthew Ribnick, to name just a few. The nature of their work ranges from comedy to drama, but one thing that they have in common is the distinctly South African flavour of their performances. To give their performances a South African flavour, they draw from our cultures and South African experiences and use this to comment on the political and social situation. Indeed, theatre has and always will be about people and their lives, and it provides an opportunity for theatre practitioners and the audience to think about their experiences and the social, political and economic situations that they find themselves in. So, South African theatre today is no less important in representing social and cultural situations and changes than theatre was during the apartheid years. In this series of lessons, we're going to meet some of today's South African theatre talents, James Ngobo, Siabonga Twala, Ngobiles Pamla, Ngetisi Shabangu and John Lata, who created and performed the play, The Suitcase. But right now, it's time for the task. Read an Ethel Fugard play such as Sizwe Banzi is dead and then answer the following questions. What was the socio-political climate in which this play was written? And would you describe the play as a protest play? And if so, why? I hope that through this series you will gain insights into theatre which will make your future visits to the theatre richer. We'll continue our exploration of South African theatre in the next lesson when we go behind the scenes to see who helps make theatre happen.